this holiday season, we're excited to present the Smileys and Christmases past. Now, I don't know about you, but I was born and raised in Southern California. And this is pretty much what my idea of winter looks like. I like to sit here in, in my office at the library on a beautiful winter day where it's sunny and warm and I can look across the San Bernardino Valley at the mountains dusted lightly with snow and think to myself, isn't that stunning? And know that that's exactly as close to the snow as I ever need to be. We have an exciting surprise for you this morning, and that is that we're going to be joined today by Director Emeritus of Smiley Library, Larry Burgess, who is the official biographer of the Smiley family. Well, good, good morning, Nathan. I'm, I'm delighted to see this slide of the University of Redlands campus, the chapel with the backdrop of the mountains, because it takes me back, if I may be a bit autobiographical. Um, my dad, um, I was born in Colorado, and uh, as were my parents, and my dad uh, had uh, seen through the Navy before World War II various places in the world, including California. And then um, serving in World War II, he was stationed uh, for much of it at the San Diego uh, Naval Base. When he went back to Colorado after the war was over and spent his first winter he realized that down deep, he yearned to uh, be away from the cold and the snow. Or as he put it so quaintly, I got tired of watching your mother in the picture window of our house waving to me as I was sh uh, shoveling the snow from the sidewalk in front in, in five degree weather. So he had an opportunity to become involved in a grocery business here in Redlands in 1949 and out we came. I was four years old, and I remember how excited he was to be in beautiful Southern California until after about three days when we were here, the picture you see in front happened. And I'll kind of clean it up because he did occasionally employ uh, language that sometimes is used in the Navy amongst the sailors. Uh, but he said, oh, goodness me, uh, it's snowing. This is what I left Colorado for. And now here we are in Redlands, what, what has happened? So that was 1949's uh, March snow. And I must also tell you that he, uh, when asked by people in later years, uh, why would you leave beautiful Colorado? He said three reasons, January, February, and March. Our story today has everything to do with climate. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, Hundreds of thousands of people moved to Southern California because they were tired of winter, basically. You could start a brand new life in Southern California and just like Larry's dad, hope never to shovel snow again. Uh, what that also meant in terms of climate was with agriculture, you could grow things here that you could not grow uh, in much of the rest of the United States. And that for us specifically is the Washington Naval Orange. Citrus in general does not like the cold. Uh, it doesn't survive winter well if there's a deep freeze and Redlands has experienced a few of those in the past. But by and large, our climate enabled not only uh, the large influx of people to places like Redlands in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, but also the agricultural industries that sustained us uh, into the 1950s. Just for some perspective, you can see when this was largely sparsely populated into the 1860s. By the turn of the century, towns had sprung up all over Southern California because suddenly we were connected by multiple transcontinental rail lines. And you could get here, of course, by ship as well. And then within the region, all of these little fledgling communities were connected by rail and interurban streetcar networks. So you can see Redlands is here on the far east side, on the far right and we were connected to all over. What that meant was that if you wanted to visit other places, you could year round because you didn't ever have to close for snow. And it also meant you could easily ship your agricultural products all over the country. Redlands, of course, really got going after its founding in 1881 by the late 1880s. And uh, if you're a student of Redlands history, you'll remember that in November of 1888, there was a big vote on whether the Redlands Township, which was just part of the county at the time, 
would incorporate into its own city. In 1889, Scipio Craig, who was the publisher of the first newspaper in Redlands, which was a weekly called the Citrograph, wrote the following editorial. So this is Christmas, 1889. Christmas, here and there, the difference. Our exchanges last week were filled with Christmas goodies in a literary and artistic way. Our Eastern friends have their papers filled with pictures and stories of the gladsome time, but they are also full of ice and snow, skating and sleigh riding, snowballing and toboggans and snowshoes. The leafless trees, the snow-covered landscape, the whistling, marrow piercing winds, and all the cheerful, question mark, accompaniments of winter in the East. There was a time when all these had a charm for us, but it was a charm nurtured in ignorance of anything better. Here, how different. The warm sun is shining in the cloudless splendor on a landscape that cannot be equaled in the entire world. All encircling the valley are high mountain ranges whose tops are all glittering in virgin white. The trees peering out of the snowbanks whose extent and depth rival those of the east. In the valley, the birds are singing, the green grass is growing lustily, and the grain making desperate attempts to grow a foot a week. The glistening, radiant green of the orange trees is seen everywhere with the golden sheen of the ripening fruit peeping out, the most striking scene in all nature and the handsomest, the king among trees. Children are merrily playing, clad in garments of only ordinary thickness, and no extra wraps visible anywhere. Men with coats off are comfortable, and we sit riding in a room without fire and in our shirt sleeves. No frost, no snow, except on the mountains, where it only adds picturesqueness to the view. No chilling winds, no feature, but adds to the beauty of the surroundings. And look at the markets. Nothing one is accustomed to in the East is lacking. The toothsome turkey is everywhere present, flanked by chickens, ducks, quail, rabbits, and game, fish fresh from the Pacific, crabs, shrimps, crawfish, no lobsters on this coast, but the ocean crawfish are better, and everything fresh and nice. All vegetables are here too, not only the cabbage, potato, parsnip, carrot, and celery, but fresh, ripe tomatoes, green peas, beans, and corn as well. As for fruits, what can be named that is not here? Ripe oranges, fresh plucked from the tree, rich red strawberries and raspberries, apples as good as New York ever saw, pears melting in their lusciousness, persimmons as big as your fist, pomegranates, and... But what is the use of enumerating? It's an old story to us here, and only serves to intensify the longing our Eastern readers have to be here, a longing which many of them cannot gratify. Looking on this picture, and then on that, let us who are here be doubly grateful that our lives have been cast in pleasant places, not forgetting a tear of regret for those who are not here with us. Redlands had several hotels very early on in our history, and in the Sunday, December 29th, 1888 issue of the Citrograph, they listed the menus of two of the hotels as they were serving their guests. You can see here at the Sloan House, which was on West State Street, it said had an elegant menu including roast goose as well as roast turkey, pumpkin and mince pies, fresh grown vegetables. Interestingly, the Hotel Windsor, which was also on West State Street, and you can see its menu printed there at the bottom of the screen. If you look those over, several of the dishes, and this is interesting because shortly after this, when the official incorporation of the city happened, Redlands would go into a very strongly prohibitionist mode. Several of the dishes on this list are made with booze. You'll see rum, and you'll see brandy and champagne, things that you probably wouldn't see in 1889. The following year, this was printed in the Citrograph about the Hotel Windsor. On Christmas morning at the breakfast table, 
every boarder at the Hotel Windsor was presented with a handsome souvenir with the compliments of Mr. and Mrs. McConkie, the genial host and accomplished hostess. These graceful remembrances were very acceptable to those who make that hotel their temporary home and were thoroughly appreciated. There's a little bit of a sad footnote to the Hotel Windsor that Larry's gonna now share with us. Well, it would be the last happy Christmas for Mr. and Mrs. McConkie, because in the next year, uh, it turns out that um, Mr. McConkie, suspecting that uh, Mrs. was having an assignation with uh, a local printer who worked for Scipio Craig at the Citrograph, one morning came downstairs, had called for a meeting in the office of the hotel, which is on the first floor, and um, the young man came in, McConkie drew out his revolver, fired and killed uh, young Mr. Gresham, and then turned the gun to his head and committed suicide, uh, a double killing. Mrs. McConkie, screaming and literally out of control emotionally, was comforted by many guests, including Albert Smiley, not exactly a great welcome to Redlands, but uh, to make a long story very short, uh, the hotel was a class A hotel and the Windsor uh, tragedy uh, marked a lot of people for many years. But that's another story and not a happy Christmas tale. Into the 1890s, Redlands was growing at a pretty dramatic pace and you can see how the scale of downtown Redlands had changed from those earliest years of, of kind of a chaparral and maybe one or two uh, buildings to a full-fledged town. And this is the intersection at State and Orange Streets. State is going left to right and Orange, we're looking south. And that big building at the far end of the street is actually the YMCA slash City Hall slash Redlands Public Library building that was completed in early 1894. The building on the right on the corner is the first National Bank of Redlands in its first incarnation of building. And it was designed by T.R. Griffith, who was also the architect of Smiley Public Library just a couple years later. And you can even see the bricks that are used to pave the street in this photo. It's a great picture to really show how Redlands was growing up in this time. And of course, when it came to the Christmas season, the local merchants were sure that they had exactly what you need for Christmas gifts. And of course, at that time, jewelers were more than happy to suggest that jewelry was the most appropriate gift. Here, Christmas at Gillis and Spores is evidenced by the display of immense lines of useful and ornamental goods in toilet seats, perfumeries, brushes, leather goods, purses, cutlery, fancy stationery, gentlemen's traveling cases, and holiday goods in other lines. Clearly, Gillis and Spores had almost anything you could possibly want to give as a gift. And never to be outdone or to not toot its own horn when it believed it needed to, the Citrograph advertised that the best Christmas present the Redlands people can make their Eastern friends is a year's subscription to the Citrograph. But now let's turn East to two of our favorite people in Redlands history lore, Albert and Alfred Smiley. Just want to say a few words about this picture, if I may. Uh, Alfred is on the left and uh, Albert uh, is on the right. They both had adjoining resorts. Alfred's was called Lake Minnewaska, but they are here at Lake Mohonk, which was uh, Albert's uh, resort. And um, the boys, uh, identical twins, also thought the same on many issues. And one of them was that during the winters when there were no guests at either resort and the, the work was being done of repair and upkeep and maintenance and construction of roads and all that sort of thing, uh, that they could better uh, spend their time in the beauty of salubrious climate. And that ended up being Redlands, California. We won't go into the reasons why they chose Redlands, but they're, they're interesting. And they certainly made an impact on this town. So here you see them uh, probably in the, uh, it looks like a summer scene, uh, standing on the boat dock, but uh, uh, perhaps in their mind, they were already plotting out, when are you leaving for Redlands 
we're leaving on such and such. This is part of the Mohawk Mountain House. Uh, I, I say part of because it even expanded uh, after this uh, into really almost the recent present days. The, the mountain house uh, sits atop the hill and had beautiful views. And it provided also a very interesting vehicle for the Smiley family, the Albert Smiley family and the Daniel Smiley family. They would put advertising literature about Redlands on a nice table as guests went into the main dining room so that a number of their guests would ultimately become winter residents of Redlands and would find themselves celebrating Christmas in Redlands. Here's the family, the one that I, I'll, I'll identify all of them, but, but we'll zero in on one in particular. Standing to the left is Hugh Smiley. Looking up and gazing is Francis Smiley. Uh, then is Bert Smiley. And with the beard to the right is Daniel Smiley, uh, Alfred and Albert's younger brother. Seated uh, is Albert Smiley's wife, Eliza. Of course, Albert in the middle. And to the right, Effie Smiley, Daniel's wife. And Daniel and Effie's children, all of these children are their children, Ruth Smiley. Uh, and Ruth Smiley, Sanborn Drake, uh, came to Redlands early on, spent much of her life, early life at Mohawk, but she became a Redlander and she ended up owning the famous Smiley Heights Park. And um, she figures prominently into many of the uh, stories that have to do with Redlands development and also even Christmas stories. It may seem uh, out of place to have a picture of the appointment of Albert K. Smiley by the President of the United States to the United States Board of Indian Commissioners in December, 1879. But this turned out to be a good thing for Redlands without anybody knowing it because that commission would often send its uh, members to various uh, places for uh, looking at the situation of the Native Americans in the United States and discussing possibilities of, about reservations and secure land uh, for, for the Indians as well as uh, looking over and reviewing treaties. Not once, but twice, Smiley came out to Southern California, and it was there that he first beheld the possibilities of the greater San Bernardino Valley. Ultimately, it would cause him to settle in Redlands. This is a photograph that I took on Christmas Day in 2017 when Larry and I and our families were fortunate enough to be at Lake Mohonk uh, for Christmas. And the funny irony with this photograph, I think, is that this is maybe a view that Albert Smiley never saw because by the time all of this was created in this way, he wasn't there for Christmas. He was likely here in Redlands in Southern California. Even in the advertising literature that the Mohawk Mountain House would use, Daniel Smiley would uh, invoke uh, the charms of Southern California. Note the middle, um, where courtesy, hospitality, and a homelike atmosphere prevail, where the allurement and beauty of California and the quaintness and charm of Europe and more can be found at Lake Mohonk Mountain House. The scene from the Albert K. Smiley House in Canyon Crest Park, or Smiley Heights as it's popularly known, um, is in the park that the twin brothers, Alfred and Albert, created in 1889-90, and then continuing on after that. It's a stunning view of the valley and the uh, San Bernardino Mountains, and uh, it, it's one that tourists would come through and just marvel at. So you can see the almost uh, alluring and seductive nature of which that pamphlet referred to of California. The house uh, included a second uh, story bedroom that uh, also had that view and uh, was beautifully adorned in that 200 acre park. And this was uh, always a treat for people, particularly coming from the Midwest and the East in the winter to come out and see all of this and think, wow, uh, this is the promised land. Albert um, was a hands-on uh, gardener and those clippers in his hand are not just for uh, looks, 
he actually would uh, get in and work with some of the flowers and also pick bouquets for the family standing by one of the iconic summer houses with the uh, thatches of palms. What's really telling about this photo for me is that this is a scene that could not happen during the same period of the year in New York. So they were coming out here to spend their winters and Albert Smiley in December, January, February, March could grow all kinds of flowers and other plants, which just simply didn't happen in a place that had actual winter. And Nathan uh, points out something very important there. I, so, I hadn't really thought about it quite in this way. Um, they loved, the, the twins loved flowers. So by creating a winter haven, it actually made it possible for them to have beautiful trees and blooming flowers all year long. This is a great letter that we pulled out of the collection at the library that was written by Albert Smiley in 1895 to his younger brother Daniel, who was back in New York. And I'll just share the first bit of it where he writes, such beautiful weather, how I wish thee and Effie were here now to enjoy it. We've been here 23 days and only one stormy day and about 20 perfect days. We have roses and carnations in abundance. The oranges are ripening about three weeks earlier than last year. We've picked about 300 boxes of oranges and are still picking. And this is probably a good time to shift a little bit to the importance of the orange industry to our part of the San Bernardino Valley in particular, because it was this agricultural gold that helped propel the Redlands economy through this whole period of time. And with so many winter residents coming here, it, the orange became a symbol of California. So many people would choose to send oranges, boxes of oranges, back to their friends in the east, uh, in the land of snow. And, and I'm sure they meant well by it, but I can imagine that it was also maybe a little bit of rubbing their noses in it, that they were enjoying a beautiful, warm winter while their friends endured actual winter. During the 1890s, hundreds of boxes of fruit were sent both by freight and by express as gifts all over the country. By the 1905 holiday season, a box of fruit was $2 that they could buy and then ship. Uh, Nathan, I just want to add something too. Uh, for a contemporary 2020 season, uh, I think it's for 11 bucks you can buy one of those ship anything you want boxes from the post office. And we still will send some fresh fruit uh, in them. It's not a lot, but it's exciting. And two people, relatives in Colorado, who just are thrilled to get these fabulous uh, Redlands fruit uh, direct uh, to their house. So it's just a thought. I actually did that one year to a friend of mine who was in Chicago. <laughs> well, the, those who were fortunate enough to receive these gifts of boxes of oranges would have received a box likely that had some kind of label on the end. And most of us are probably familiar with citrus labels. Maybe they received a label like this, which depicted the quintessential Southern California Redlands winter on it. So there you can see the San Bernardino Mountains and Redlands in the foreground and Mount Harrison in between. Or maybe you received a box with a label like this, Park brand, which included an actual photo image of uh, Redlands and Mount San Bernardino, Mount San Bernardino covered with snow and the picture taken from Canyon Crest Park or Smiley Heights. Or maybe they might even have received a box with this label on the end, Canyon Crest brand, of course, named for the Smiley's estate uh, and park here in Redlands. And then again, you see the uh, beautiful snow covered Mount San Bernardino, the Burridge Mansion in the foreground. This also taken from by artistic license from Smiley Heights too. And of course the Smiley's did send fruit that they had picked to their friends. This is a letter written from Charles Leal, who lived on Madison Avenue in New York. And he is saying, thank you. Yesterday, the expressman left a box of delicious oranges from Canyon Crest Park, Redlands, California. Each one was in excellent condition. A card enclosed showed that they had come from our dear friends on the Pacific side of our continent. Leal's an interesting uh, guy too, just as a footnote. He was a frequent guest at Mohonk, and while a very young doctor, ended up 
on a night in April 1865 in a theater box, being one of the attending physicians seeking to help save Abraham Lincoln's life. Yeah, interesting, in the letter, he goes on to write that the oranges made us long to visit beautiful redlands, of which we have had such charming accounts from patients who in their tours through the Golden State have visited your wonderful country. The um, Pacific Outlook paper ran an article about Canyon Crest Park, Smiley Heights. Uh, I should explain the family called it Canyon Crest Park. That was its official name, but people, as we do, shortened it to more ease for them, um, Smiley Heights. Anyhow, um, Canyon Crest Park, and I, I'd like to read an excerpt from it, if I may. Uh, here again is that sort of um, uh, a little dagger of uh, envy that uh, is thrown at the Eastern folks. The Christmas bells had rung out their glad song of peace on earth, goodwill to men, and the bright star in the east, whose light years ago guided the shepherds to where the Christ child lay, had been lost in the rays of the sun, which was now throwing its golden light over green grass and trees and brilliant flowers. Can this really be Christmas Day? Here is the holly and the pine, but where the flakes of feathery white, of which for years we have sung on Christmas morn? Where the frozen pond, the jingle of sleigh bells, the ice and snow with which we've had associated with the Christmas season? We had come from the far northeast, from the kingdom of Jack Frost, and Christmas morning finds us in Redlands, California in the midst of green trees and summer flowers. Do you wonder that we again exclaim, can this really be Christmas day? Redlands is a gem of a city set in luxuriant orange groves and surrounded by snow-capped mountains. Among its many points of interest is Canyon Crest Park, a park which for beauty and grandeur is now famous. It was partly a desire to visit this park that brought us to Redlands and for once the well-known saying, quote, off expectation fails, where most it promises, quote, proved untrue, for we found more than expectation promised. At the junction of the roadways that lead through different parts of the hill, we come to the unpretentious home of owner, Mr. A.K. Smiley, the man who has transformed a great barren waste of land into the garden spot of California, and who has given this feast of beauty to the public to enjoy without cost, and who maintains the park at his personal expense. We had just passed the beds of golden colored pansies and the modest violets mingling their perfume, that, that of the tea roses which formed a hedge about the well-kept lawn, when we came upon a kindly face, a white-haired gentleman whose hands were full of freshly cut roses. He stopped to direct us to some special point of interest further on and we knew instinctively that he was the owner of the mountain, for the happiness he had given to others is reflected in his face. We continue our journey down the roadway on the side of the mountain, which winds among the palms, the acacia, and the graceful drooping pepper trees, on through the masses of bud and blossom, down to the lower end of the roadway, which is hedged about on one side with climbing roses, growing to the height of 15 feet, back of which are rows of olive trees, heavily loaded with ripened fruit. On the other side are thousands of oranges. We regretfully pass on and out of this Garden of Eden, where nature, even at holiday time, is ever her spring, when the trees enjoy perpetual youth and the flowers bloom continually. We come away feeling not that we have had a wonderful play, but that we have had a service of sermon and song. In the quiet calm of nature, where one looks from nature to nature's God, where strife and anger and hatred have no place, we realize that peace on earth is the knowledge of what one man has done for the happiness of many to see and to enjoy. Well, there's that snow back, even in Smiley Heights, Nathan. 
Yeah, I guess it wasn't always a perfect winter. There were these occasional moments of, of reflection to the east. Christmas morning was ushered in by one of the hardest earthquakes in the annals of California. The shake at 425 and succeeded in waking up everybody within a radius of many miles. That was Christmas morning of 1899. This is the city of San Jacinto, which was closer to the epicenter than Redlands was. And San Jacinto and Hemet were both hit very hard. And here you can see from this photograph that it was a major disaster for the city of San Jacinto. We should add that the uh, legend has it that Albert Smiley, whose chimneys had collapsed on the house that you see from the quake, uh, quickly set with binoculars to look down to the, the then relatively not even year old library uh, to make sure that its tower and building was okay. They were. And of course, the publishing industry lost no time trying to figure out how best to publicize Southern California and the Land of Sunshine magazine, which was a really important booster publication for Southern California in 1900, wrote to Albert Smiley because it was going to be doing a special a holiday issue just on Redlands. So the letter was written in November of 1900 for the December publication of The Land of Sunshine. And here is the resulting article that appeared to talk about the glories of Redlands in its holiday issue. Of course, the library and Smiley Heights being featured prominently uh, throughout the article. The Reverend uh, A.C. Hagman, who had a small church uh, down in one of the valleys near the Mohonk Mountain House Resort, became good friends of the Smileys. And here you have a letter from uh, Mrs. Hagman writing to Effie Smiley from High Falls, New York, to Effie in Redlands, California, uh, talking about the Christmas plans. It's dated December 24th, as you can see, and about how their thoughts are with the Smileys and hoping that they're having a nice Christmas uh, as well. And it's uh, just an example of, of the kind of kindred spirits because I'm sure the Hagmans had definitely received a box of oranges. From uh, the Deo family comes a letter. The, the Deos were part of the original Huguenot settlement in New Paltz, New York, which is the mailing address for the Mohawk Mountain House. And, and those houses go back to the mid 16 and early 1700s. And this is one of the uh, Deos thanking them for the beautiful uh, fruit and wishing them the best for the holidays and the new year. Here's a great letter from, our, from the archives from 1904 and it's young Bert Smiley writing from college at Haverford home to his father, Daniel. And uh, most of that family was staying uh, in New York for the winter. Albert and Eliza, of course, were going to be coming to California. But he writes to, to his father, I'm sorry indeed to hear that thee is not going to be with us at Christmas, for I looked forward to some good old talks and good times, but perhaps they may only be postponed until the spring vacation. Now about the holidays. I would like to know if it would be all right to ask Art, my roommate, to spend them with us. He is a good, quiet fellow and would understand and enjoy our mode of life up there in the winter, and I know he would have a good time. Hugh would like to have him, and I'm quite sure Francis would. And it's signed, Thy Loving Son, Bert. Now this is a number of years later. This is also written by Bert, back to his father and mother. And in a role reversal, Bert is actually here in Redlands for Christmas in 1918. Uh, writing back to New York where his parents are. And he says, thank you both for the good letters and for the Christmas check, both of which we appreciate ever so much. So even then, a check is always a wonderful gift to your children. Well, it's a quintessential photo of Albert. Could be any of us uh, in Redlands this Christmas, being thankful, I think, for our health and the fact that we have such incredible weather and we can be standing in our own gardens, maybe not 200 acres worth, but uh, this photo is really emblematic of what it means in some ways on a deeper level uh, to enjoy our surroundings and what, how fortunate we really are in Redlands. 
Here we see Daniel and Albert Smiley at the Santa Fe Depot, along with a friend, in what is probably the last photo we have taken of Albert Smiley in Redlands. The Santa Fe Depot was finished in 1910, and uh, he sadly passed away in December of 1912. Both of the twins, when they knew or suspected that their lives were going to be ending, wanted to come out to Redlands for the winter, uh, even in failing health. And so it was true that Alfred Smiley, uh, as you see from this uh, telegram sent by his brother Albert, had left for Redlands and it would uh, be there that he would spend his last Christmas and would uh, pass away in early 1903 here in, here in town. And also in 1912, Albert, uh, I think suspecting that he was failing rapidly, came out to Redlands, and um, here's this note from December 4th. Uh, however, uh, Albert would not make it to see Christmas of 1912, and his dear wife, Eliza, would die in the very first few days of 1913. But Redlands meant for them a chance to look out at the mountains and see the beauty, and so it was a very a purposeful desire, and in a sense how fortunate they both were to survive the trip from the east and then to be able to see out among their friends and family their final days of the beauty of this area. Well, shifting back now to things that were going on in the community, here is a, a little tidbit from Christmas time 1900, and I think it's funny because clearly nothing says peace on earth quite like Skirmish firing by Company G held on Christmas Day. Or how about in Christmas time 1901? They wrote, Tuesday afternoon, a Christmas tree social on the elegant grounds of Henry Fisher was a novel feature for the little friends of Mrs. Fisher, who provided the entertainment which will long remain in their memories. Unusually handsome presents were in the distribution at the close of one of the most unique Christmas festivities ever attempted by a love giver in Redlands. And here from the same period of time, a funny little thing at the Elks Lodge, which at this period of time was located in the post office block, currently the site of Ed Hales Park before the brand new post office was built on Brookside. But from 1903 on, this was a post office block and the Elks Lodge. The Elks themselves built a brand new lodge in 1911. But here in this, you can see it at the Elks Doings Wednesday evening, there was one member that was completely flabbergasted, and that was their exalted ruler, William Medlin. The boys put up a job on him and all but knocked him out. H.B. Wilson was Santa Claus and presided over the Christmas tree, which tree is a regular thing with the Elks. Of course, the presents are the hugest Joshes that can be imagined. So when Billy got his huge square box with wire attachment, he was prepared for almost anything but what he got. It turned out after opening box after box to be a tiny casket containing one of the handsomest elk badges that could be procured, tooth hand mounted, engraved and set with a big diamond. Billy says he's laying awake nights contriving some way to get even. But unfortunately, not everything is always wonderful and happy on Christmas day the Cherrier family, who was just in the process of moving to Redlands and building a beautiful new home on West Fern Avenue, on Christmas morning, their young son went out on horseback ride and fell off his horse and sadly died as a result of his injuries. So a very sad Christmas for the Cherrier and their family in 1910. But Redlands has always had great community festivities for the Christmas time, and one of those for many years was a a municipal Christmas tree at the Triangle. Many of you may be aware of the Triangle, but I bet a lot of you aren't because things have changed in the way that downtown has been sort of re-engineered over the years. A lot of traditional communities, especially in the East, have a kind of a town square. But for Redlands, our town square was a triangle. And it was a triangle because when you look at the topography of Redlands, it necessitated that the, for the streets as they were laid out south of Citrus Avenue, they would follow the topography 
and how water would run off and things like that. And so they're not at a north, south, east, west true grid. They're actually turned like 38 degrees or something like that. So when those streets meet uh, Citrus Avenue, they meet a true northwest, east, south street grid for everything that's north of that. And it makes for some really unusual intersections. So at this period of time, early on, Cajon Street actually continued in a straight line all the way to Citrus Avenue. And Orange Street came in a totally straight line to about half a block south of Citrus Avenue. And then of course, Citrus still ran east-west. And what that meant was a little triangular island of land in between where those three streets came together. Today, that's all been completely re-engineered. Cajon Street continues with a curve to Citrus Avenue and the section of Cajon that was between that curve and uh, Citrus has been vacated by the city and now is occupied by that really stunning cinder block construction for the phone company. But here you can see the triangle as it looked in the 1920s with the massive oak tree that just been planted uh, a number of years before. Before it was planted, it was tradition to bring a tree from somewhere uh, like the San Bernardino Mountains, or in this particular year, the municipal Christmas tree uh, to be erected at the Triangle was brought down from Smiley Heights, which meant that Daniel Smiley had given permission to cut down one of the large trees in Smiley Heights or Canyon Crest Park to be used as the municipal Christmas tree downtown. And it was a big event to come down decorating the Christmas tree. There was a whole program and, and singing and the whole deal uh, down at the Triangle. In 1914, this is what the municipal Christmas tree looked like, and you can see it here all decorated. A few years later, uh, here is the municipal Christmas tree as it appeared complete strung with lights, uh, electric lights to illuminate the tree in the early 1920s. And this was a tradition that continued through the 1920s. Eventually, instead of bringing down from somewhere else a tree that was cut, what actually happened is they would just sort of shape the oak tree and decorate the oak. Looking into the mid-century period, uh, here in 1958, downtown Redlands was getting decorated uh, by the crews in anticipation of the annual Christmas parade. What I love about this particular display, which is over the intersection at State and Orange Streets, we're actually looking uh, east on State Street in this picture from Orange. Here you see a, a train uh, and Santa and his reindeer flying through the sky. But what's funny is Santa's sleigh is on a direct path to hit the train. So not sure if, if the train was moving quickly enough that, that Santa would be able to pass by or they'd make a last minute maneuver to avoid collision there uh, with the train. But here we see part of that parade. Here the parade is going down uh, Citrus Avenue, facing west on Citrus. You see the candy canes decorating the lampposts. And here Miss Redlands is, is riding in a beautiful uh, convertible, which was doubtless a brand new model in 1958. We've got some great stuff that's come in as part of the uh, Redlands Home Movie Preservation Project. So here we have a little blip I'm going to share with you of Christmas in 1963. Surely this is the kind of quintessential, typical Christmas gathering. Christmas morning, families getting together to open gifts, children exciting. You have the fire burning in the fireplace. Beautiful tinsel decorating the tree. All of the Christmas cards prominently displayed for all to see. And you can see they received quite a number of cards that year. And then maybe later in the afternoon when the eggnog and Christmas cheer had been flowing with great regularity uh, to enjoy the rest of Christmas afternoon. I think you'd better rename that the spirits of Christmas. <laughs> Here's a clip from the 1971 Christmas Parade. Uh, 
Here we're on North Orange Street, just south of the freeway, across from MJ's on Q, which was there, different parades. We have the high school band coming down the street. I was never able to ride a unicycle. Do you have that kind of balance, Larry? Are you kidding? I'd be more bruised than anything else. Here, the funny thing to me is that in 1971, this car wasn't that old. And I love the aluminum Christmas tree coming down the street on this float. Here are the participants in the Great Y Circus with their entry in the Christmas parade. Of course, no parade seems to be complete without its entire uh, equestrian cadre. Young bands. Early modes of transit. Who knew Santa could ride a horse? And finally, bringing up the uh, final float in the parade is Santa surrounded by Santa's little helpers. And what Southern California winter Christmas time uh, would be complete without a trip to Santa's village. And with that, we really appreciate that you've chosen to spend your morning with us. We hope that you have a very warm, safe holiday season. Larry, do you have any final thoughts? Very original. Merry Christmas, happy holidays, and happy new year. Thank you all. Have a great time. <laughs>